right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Scientist to Go. Uh, my name is Eowyn, and I am one of the educators in our lab venture program here at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. So uh, today I have Jill Pelta with me, and I am going to go ahead and hand it on over to her. Oh, actually, before I do that, I apologize. Um, for the structure today, uh, she's going to do her 20 to 25 minute presentation, and then we'll have the question and answer. Please go ahead and send all of those questions you have um, as she's talking as soon as they occur to you, and then we'll save them all for the end and we'll read them out for her um, to answer for you. All right, now I'm over to you. Awesome. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jill, and I'm going to be talking today about what I do, which I work as an artist, but my work is about science and about things like climate change. And so I'll share a little bit about that in a presentation. And um, I know there'll be lots of information in that, so um, I'm, I'll be excited for any of your questions after. And I am um, based currently in um, Washington State, but I moved there here from Maine, where I was for about 10 years. So I definitely miss Maine as well, but a lot of the similar outdoors things are great here. So that's been really nice. Oh, sorry, just one minute. I'm going to minimize the um, videos on the side of my screen. Okay. So like I said, I am an artist and my work is about topics around the environment. And so this is a painting of mine in the background and those fish are supposed to be salmon and they're swimming across and underneath those salmon you'll see that um, jagged line and so that line is actually a graph and so it's it, it's telling a change over time and the change is the population or the amount of these salmon so over time I highlighted that line sometimes the population goes up and then sometimes the population goes down of the salmon but there's a story here and I'm trying to tell that story with the image in my painting. So I'm going to be sharing with you guys some of these um, artworks today and then also a little bit about uh, my journey and how I got to this place. Um, so I work as an artist and a science communicator. Um, the photo on the left is actually me working in the studio space I had um, in Portland, Maine when I was there last year and the photo of me on the right is me working um, where I live now in Washington State in the mountains and basically doing science research on the snow and ice on the mountains here. So I want to define what, what I mean in this case by science communicator. It's basically just someone who helps other people to learn about science. And so that, of course, could be your teacher, but it's also using different means. And so I use painting to help people learn about science. Other people can use writing, um, music. They can take people outside to just see and understand changes to the world themselves. It's just any form of communication around topics, and it's really cool to get creative around that. So I went, I went to the University of Maine um, for college, and um, it was then that I also got this background in studying our earth and studying our climate. So I have a bunch of photos here of some really neat places I got to go travel to when I was at, um, when I was in college there. And so that's one cool thing about um, doing like studying like the oceans or the earth or the climate is a lot of times you can apply to trips and get to study these places yourself. And so I got to go to New Zealand and Antarctica. Um, I got to go to the Falkland Islands, which are way down south um, near South America. Um, and then I got to do my work that I still do here in Washington. And so just getting to study these places firsthand was really fun and has really inspired my art. And then just to take a, um, a step back for a minute and how, how I even got into this kind of line of um, study when I was in college, these are two photos of me um, from when I was in high school. Um, I started getting really into art um, probably when I, was, when I was in middle school, but then I got more serious about it in high school. So this is me in my classroom at that time. And then I was also lucky in that I got to go do some science work in high school. And so the photo of me on the right is working on the mountains here in Washington, um, which was really cool because I grew up in Massachusetts. And so I never seen this type of landscape before. 
And then I just wanted to show you guys one example of some art that I made um, when I was in high school. And this was some of my um, first kind of way, um, first kind of tries of making art inspired by like nature and the climate changing and things like that. And so this is a series of um, three paintings and starting on the left, um, that girl was supposed to be me and she's sitting in front of this big um, snowy mountain um, but it's a summer, which is why she has shorts. <laughs> and those plants are kind of like, kind of supposed to be magical, like representing like her love for this place. Um, and then the the painting in the middle, the girl has come back as an adult and the mountain has changed. There's not as much of snow and ice on it. And so there's a little bit less of that magic there for her. And then lastly, as you guys might guess, the painting on the right, um, she's come back as an older woman and the snow and ice on the mountain is almost gone. And so these were kind of mountains again, like I was thinking of mountains like here in Washington that have snow and ice year round. And so um, it was my way to like share these stories about something I felt like deeply emotional about and like was concerned about at that age. So nature and science like just have always inspired my artwork in different ways. And, and at first it was like the example I showed you, or these are two paintings I made of um, kind of like landscapes. When I go and do this research, I'll bring painting supplies with me. And so these were my first kind of forms of, yeah, making, making art about our environment. And then uh, I wanted to show just a few um, photos of doing that research in, in Washington. That photo on the left of the mountain is actually the mountain I painted in that high school art I just showed you that, that I was looking at as a girl. And so it's a really big um, mountain here in Washington. It's a volcano covered in snow and ice year round. Um, it's over 10,000 feet high. And so what we do is we we study all of that snow and ice. And basically we just study how much is it changing? Like how fast is it melting and getting smaller as our climate warms? And so you can see some photos of, of people um, we're measuring um, snow depth and exploring these places to see how much they're changing right now. And again, it's um it's we're up on the snow and ice, but it's summer, and so we can still wear um wear shorts when you're out in these places, which is really cool. And then I just wanted to show two examples of of change in these environments. And so one thing that's been really bad in the northwest of the U.S. has been like forest fires. And so the two photos on the top show like one day to the next of um, fire smoke getting really kind of brown and hazy over this beautiful mountain lake that we were camped near. And then the two photos on the bottom, the one on the left is showing a lot of like snow covering the mountains. And then the one on the right is showing a lot of like bare ice, which melts a lot faster than snow. And so um, you want that snow covering it. But when there's less snow, that ice is just going to be kind of open and able to be melt melted faster on these mountains. And uh, this is a photo of me um, standing um, in this like kind of rocky, like empty looking landscape because recently ice would have covered where I was. So there's no plants growing there yet because it's so recently like uncovered by snow and ice. And so you'll see behind me, there's that little like piece of ice and it's actually part of like a really big, um, a really big area of ice on this mountain. And so I kind of did the simple like animation of like how the snow and ice used to like go up right to where I was just like 10 years before and how all of that has melted back hundreds of feet to its current location. So it's really weird to see these changes just over my lifetime. So I'm going to kind of switch switch modes. I've talked to you, I'll go back to this photo for a minute. I've talked to you about um, the science work that I've done. And I know this is a little bit different environment than, you know, in Maine, but a lot of this kind of work I was doing when I was studying in Maine, I would just travel to these places. And so I'd come back to Maine and want to make art about things that I was seeing and researching. And I'd also want to make art about environmental changes in Maine, since it means so much to me. So I'm going to um, share a few examples of my artwork. And these are the paintings that also include those graphs or data that I showed you guys in the first image of salmon. And so this is a painting that's about 
the Gulf of Maine. And so it's supposed to be like the scene of the ocean um, with a fishing boat on top. And then the, all the fish, there's um, little orange shrimp and lobster. And then the sand, there's clams. And so it's like this whole um, part of the water column with all the species that live there. And then the top surface of the water um, is jagged. And that's because that's my line graph that I put in. And that graph is about how the ocean in the Gulf of Maine is warming. And so there's a lot of change. A lot, sometimes it gets colder, sometimes it gets warmer. Depends on the year, but overall the warming is happening um, really fast. And then these are just two um, close ups to give you guys some details of the species I was showing. And so I just wanted to help tell the story with my art about the warming ocean and how that would affect all these different animals that live in it. This is another painting that's about the Gulf of Maine. And I actually just finished this one um, a couple of months ago in December. And um, this one is about different seabirds that live on some of the islands in, um, in Maine, like especially up north, like over by like Acadia. And if you guys know like Camden or Rockland or any of those towns. So there's a lot of like these rocky islands off the coast of Maine where um, puffins live. And then the other type of bird that has more white is called a tern. And so this painting was about how these birds really use these islands as like their habitat to live on. And they're being affected by climate change and like their food sources. And so this was about their populations of these bird species changing. So I actually have three different um, graphs in this painting. And so I'm just gonna highlight them individually. The first graph um, that I just highlighted in this like blue is the population of puffins on this island in Maine over time. And so you can see the population went way up and now it's kind of like stayed the same um, for a longer period of time. And then next is this yeah, graph in yellow. This is the um, population of um, one type of tern called a common tern. And even though this graph isn't showing like a lot of um, like increase to their population, they've actually overall been doing really well in Maine and there's a lot more of them than there used to be. And then lastly in green is this graph of another type of tern called an arctotern. And they've actually been, they've been struggling more than the common tern. So there's less of them than there used to be. So I know there's a lot of information, but it's my way to tell stories about what's happening to these different types of seabirds. And they have just this unique way of living on these rocky islands and, and surviving. And so there might not be something we get to see all the time, but they're out there for a lot of the year. And so it was really fun to make this painting to help share their story with people. So I'm going to go into um, why I combine data and art together and just kind of talk you guys through a quick example of why I think that can be a cool thing to do. And so I know that like when we look at graphs, like the one I just I'm showing, it's they can kind of seem abstract or we can kind of like not want to, you know, understand what it's saying. They look kind of complicated, but they do tell a really good story. And so the graph in pink is basically just showing the increase in temperature for the whole world over about 150 years. So you can just see that line is going up, up, up over that time period. And it's telling that story. And so what I see when I look at that graph is things that I've personally experienced, like you guys might be experiencing warmer summers in Maine, or, you know, let, I know this winter has been not great there. It's been really warm and not much snow. And one thing I think about with warming temperatures is these forest fires that I experience in the Northwest. And so I put this graph of like the smoky day, or I put the image of the smoky day behind that graph of temperature because it's that's why these graphs matter. They all have these personal um, stories for, for each of us that mean something and are emotional to us. And I made a painting about that topic to kind of show the comparison. I used that same graph and I made it kind of the top of this like burning forest fire. And this is my way to tell that story about this topic and why it matters to me. So here's that graph on its own that can, or that image on its own that can have a lot more of that kind of emotion behind it. 
So in my opinion, by combining data and art in this kind of way, I can just build these new connections and seeing data and seeing the world. Um, my goal with this is just to help people learn about our, our environment and um, to get to like touch in on those emotions around the science a little bit more easily. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to really quickly to tell you guys a little bit about my process with um, creating these pieces, because I think it can be neat to see behind the scenes of how it's done. And so um, the painting I'm going to show you guys, like the, the topic I chose was sea level rise on coastal marshes in the Gulf of Maine. And so it was, this is a photo kind of these environments, like these grassy marshes that are along the coast in a lot of places in Maine. Second, I found a graph on um, sea level rise. So again, that um, increasing um, blue and black line is showing sea level rise over time. And then the third step is just to brainstorm how my art piece is going to look. So this is a real sketch I made when I was planning my piece. They're really simple and messy and quick. I'm doing like little lines and stick figures. I'm just thinking like quick ideas. How is this piece? How is this painting going to look? You know, where do I want people to be? Where do I want the water to be? All these kind of decisions. I'll just try out a bunch of stuff. And so I'll do that until I find one that I like. And then I'm ready to create. And I'll find a bunch of images that I can use to help me make my painting. So these are a bunch of different species and things. Um, these are all just images I found online, but you can also go take photos yourself. And I'll start to sketch. I do everything in pencil before I add color. So I'm sketching fish and birds. And then I started working on my final paintings. The green around it is just this like tape um, to tape my paper to like a board to keep my paper flat. And then I'm filling in like just colors at a time. The bottom is where the fish are in the ocean. And then I started filling in the yellow is gonna be this like grass, kind of when it turns more grass, like turns more yellow in the fall. And this is me working in my studio in Portland. And then starting to fill in more and more and getting close to being done. And then these are the finished pieces. And so um, just to quickly walk you guys through the story, it was again about sea level rise affecting these grassy marshes along the coast. And so the kind of green area with fish at the bottom is supposed to be the ocean with that sea level rise graph. Oh, sorry, that sea level rise graph along the bottom there going up and behind it, the, the grass with the more shallow water in the marsh. And I had lots of people kind of interacting and exploring and studying it. I had people planting grasses. So I tried to include a lot of details into the story. And here are a few close-ups of um, the types of fish that all live um, in the Gulf of Maine or in these um, shallow marsh areas and some different types of birds. And then these paintings are actually in a museum in Massachusetts. If you, any of you guys have ever been to Salem, it's really fun to visit. And it's a little bit north of Boston. And there's a cool museum there called the Peabody Essex Museum. And my pieces are part of a big show around climate action. And so there's a bunch of other artists there too. And it's up through the summer. And so again, that, that painting I just showed you guys had a lot of details. I had a lot of different stories. And what I started with was this graph. And I tried to figure out how to help people learn about this graph and how to help people learn about this graph, this story about sea level rise and why, why it matters to us personally. So um, lastly, before I talk with you guys that one big thing I'm doing with this kind of work is um, bringing this idea to students of all different ages. And so these are students I worked with this last year. They're making their own data art. So they found graphs and they had to decide their um, story and they had to make their art. And so here are some of the paintings that they made. Some of these ones are really good. There's all different like levels of art, but either way, all the stories were really cool. And so the all different topics about bees and birds and forest fires that they chose to make their art pieces about. I think that when we learn about 
um, science topics, um, it's important to recognize there's so many different ways we can learn. There's not just one way. And so we can look online at websites about like different science projects and we can look at photographs of research. And then like I have examples of um, like a science paper, which is not something that a lot of people are going to look at, um, but it's but has important information and it has a lot of that data in it. And so what I'm trying to do is just like, just share this kind of information with with different people by making art about it. And so we've all these different ways to share the same topic. And I think the art is one newer way that people are using to share science. So my takeaways for, for you guys are just first, art can really connect people with important topics. So for me, that's around climate change, but that could be around anything. You can make art about things that just really matter to you. Second, I think that with creativity, really important graphs and data can tell personal and relatable stories. And I think it's really cool and important for us to understand kind of what graphs are saying sometimes. And lastly, um, my primary goal is, with my art, at least, is just to help start conversations around these climate change topics in everyday life. And so whether that's about the Gulf of Maine and what's happening there or beyond, I think that kind of talking about it is such a great way to um, kind of be involved because you're learning and you're hearing new things from other people and you're sharing what you care about with other people. Thank you guys so much for, for listening to that. I know it's a lot of information and um, I appreciate it. So I look forward to hearing any questions you might have. Wonderful, thank you, Jill. So I have got a lot of really good questions. Um, so first you were talking a lot about mountains. So I have a few questions about mountains in general. Uh, what is your favorite mountain in Washington? Oh, fun. Um, I think my favorite mountain is actually the one I did that painting of in high school where I was a girl because it's called Mount Baker. And like I said, it's um it's almost 11,000 feet and it's a volcano, but not like, you know, in danger of erupting or anything. And it's um just covered in ice and snow. But I think the reason why I love it is just because I've gotten to go there so much. I've gotten to go there 14 times. And so it just means like you know, when you guys get to go to maybe like your favorite beach and like you keep going and you just like really love that place. That's what that mountain has has become to me is getting to go there a lot and, and see it in all different forms. Excellent. Um, have you ever hiked uh, mountains over here, like Mount Washington, Mount Katahdin or any part of the Appalachian Trail? Oh, yeah, I loved I love hiking in the Northeast. Um, I've done like little pieces of the Appalachian Trail. I've done a lot of hikes in the, I loved going to the White Mountains in like New Hampshire. Um, and yeah, I've hiked Mount Katahdin a number of times. And so actually I've, I have hiked some of the mountains around Mount Washington, but I've just actually driven up so far. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, so now uh, thinking about uh, kind of the differences between Washington and Maine, what are you noticing are the differences in their climate as well as landscape? Yeah. There's, there's some, yeah, obviously big similarities, like a lot of, um, there's a lot of like wild land here, like there are in parts of Maine, and a lot of areas of forest, but um, the mountains are just, they're younger, actually, a lot younger than the mountains in the Northeast, and so the mountains in the Northeast used to be really, really tall, like the ones here, and they just aren't anymore, because they've gotten like weathered down, and so the mountains here are just a lot bigger, because they're newer, and so as a result, that's why they have all that snow and ice on them because they just get so much colder and they get a ton of snow every winter. And so that's been fun because it's a different kind of environment when, um, and, and as a result of that snow and ice, there's like different, different animals and different wildflowers. So I love observing that. Like one of the really cool things here is there are um, these, the white, like fluffy kind of mountain goats and, they are in like big herds in the mountains here. And so I love like getting to see those now and then. That's so cool. I had no idea that the our mountains used to be bigger, that you just blew my mind a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It was a good fact. <laughs> um, what kind of ways do you know of that could maybe help us res um, reversing some of these climate change trends that we're noticing? Oh, that's a hard one. I think 
I know some about this topic, but honestly, I'm not the best informed on it. So I think there's a lot of ways that like maybe more like high tech ways that I couldn't really speak to that maybe people are pursuing. But I think the biggest thing, um, in my opinion, is just like really, really big change, like country, like at the scale of like our whole country and things like that. Um, to stop using fossil fuels and to to move over towards like using renewable energy. And so I think that's like, because that's so big, that's not something like everyone's going to be involved with. I think that needs to happen on a big scale. But I think what we can do um, is those kind of projects around renewable energy happen like locally or just in our like one state. And so that's the kind of thing I, thing I think some people can more easily be involved with. Definitely. And even if it's not, you know, statewide or countrywide, you know, different mm -hmm. communities can be doing really good projects, you know, like yeah, adding totally. bus lanes and more, you know, public transit in your area. Yeah. So at all different levels, there's lots of good community change that can help. Yeah. Um, so for our next question is now kind of transitioning to kind of talking about your art. So um, do you think your finished project would be the same if you didn't work through that kind of strategic plan planning process that you have? I think, no, I don't think it would be the same. And there are a lot of artists who, who like, who don't do that, like planning, like you don't have, like, I think it just depends on what kind of art you want to make. I think it's really cool when an artist just goes and like, kind of sees what happens and they just play around and um and create kind of as they go and that's one style for sure too but I think for me the reason I do all that planning is because I'm really trying to tell um, a specific story to share with people and that can be hard to figure out how to do so when I plan it I think of better ideas than I would have if I didn't kind of sit down and really really try to um, figure out like how to show that with a painting okay um how would you say you found your art style? That, yeah, that felt, that's a good question because I feel like that's something that can feel difficult when you're like, when you're a really young artist and you're like, you want to develop, yeah, your voice. And I think um, for me, honestly, it, it did just come from creating a lot. And I feel like people often do kind of have a natural style that, that develops and so like if I were I showed you guys all my paintings were like watercolor paint but if I were to create art um that was like with a different kind of paint um if I were to do like drawings it would probably have a little bit of a different look and so a lot of times when there's something that you really like focus on like I'm focusing on watercolor and I'm focusing on paintings about the environment then I've kind of developed this like my style around that from just creating a lot of them over time um but whatever it is, I think the more you kind of work with it, you will kind of naturally like experiment, get inspiration from other artists, try your own things. Um, it's just something that takes time to fit, to find, I think. Excellent. Um, how did you get the idea for that first one that you showed us for like the, the glacier or the um, ice melting on the three mountains? And like, where did you get the idea? Because that's your first, is that your first time showing data through art? or like kind of projecting climate change through art? Um, I'm trying to remember, there might have been a couple other paintings, but those were, it was right around that time, like in high school, and it was like my, I think it was my senior year. Um, I was trying to create like a whole kind of like portfolio or group of like, group of maybe like 10 artworks that uh, were all about like that topic. And so mm -hmm. it was kind of during that but a big part of why I did that was because I, like I said, I was lucky and I got the opportunity to go work, to travel from Massachusetts um, to Washington to work in the mountains. And so I got to see stuff that um, that my classmates like did, weren't seeing. And that really ins inspired me. And it's also like just my love for winter growing up in Massachusetts and skiing was also a big part of it. And so um, it just came from like seeing that firsthand and wanting to like wanting to wanting to share it I guess okay um so also uh this question's from me so I know that you were on the cover of time magazine um but do you have any other like dreams for you know for future projects things that you could do 
<laughs> yeah, I have a lot. I have a lot of dreams for like just what I would love to do with my art, you know, in, in, in my lifetime. But um, I think one of them is honestly just as an artist, I'm I'm self-employed. And so that means I have to find a lot of different projects that are like the money that I make to support myself. And so that can be hard. And so see, you have to take on a lot of different types of projects. And it doesn't allow, always allow time for the kind of the art I would just do if it was totally like free mm -hmm. and open and up to me. And so one thing I would love is to have the kind of time to create um, a big like new group of art that would be like a whole show for like a, a nice gallery, for example. And so say it was like 10 paintings and they'd all be like the same kind of, they'd all across the 10 paintings, like tell a cool, powerful story. And so I think I would want it to be something around like hopeful stuff around like climate action and things that people are doing to help. And so that would be one of my dreams, like a whole, a whole new group of work that was really kind of inspiring. Um, and that I could like, yeah, just have my own like gallery show for. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that sounds like a really good dream. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, now we have a few questions about favorites. So what is your, what was, what was your favorite thing about living in Maine? Um, my favorite thing, let's see. And I lived in like around the Portland area for a while. And then I also lived more like up near Bangor when I was at UMaine. So I got to see a bunch of parts and I loved, I think I just loved the access to like so many um, local trails. I like, I did a lot of like trail running and hiking and where I live now in Washington, I don't have that access. And so that's something I really love and miss. It's just like the, the woods and all of the things you could find just exploring um, on the woods trails, like just out your backyard, basically. So I loved that. Okay. What was your favorite food from Maine? Oh, um, that's, a, that's tough because mm -hmm. I feel like Portland had a lot of great food um, options. Um, I, it's hard because unlike most people, like I don't, I just have never liked seafood. So I, that would be like an easy one to say is really good in Maine, but I don't like it for some, I just never have for some reason. And so, um, yeah, I can't really, I'm kind of like stumped on something right now. Like I had like favorite, like there was a couple, um, places for like pizza I really liked in the Portland area, but I'm not thinking of anything great. That's okay. Yeah. Um, what is your favorite fish? Oh, um, I don't think I have a favorite fish, but that's really fun to think about. Um, I think the, the sea creature that I would be, I think it would be awesome to like to experience what it'd be like to live as would be like some type of like whale. They live so long and they're really smart and just to like experience the more depths of the ocean and like what it was like to communicate. So that's kind of my non-answer to that question. <laughs> <laughs> I like that though. Whales are, you know, fish adjacent. <laughs> um, okay. So this brings me to my final two questions that I end all of our interviews with. Um, what is your favorite part of your job? My favorite part of my job is that um, as like a science communicator, I get to learn about a lot of different types of things in our world. And so like I get to maybe learn about what's happening. Yeah, like in the ocean in Maine. But then I also like maybe I do a painting about something happening in like, you know, the in rainforests and in, in South America or like things that happened in the past. And so it's just cool that I get to um, learn about a lot of different like types of topics um, in the natural sciences and like um, just kind of almost rather than focusing in on one, I get a little piece of a bunch of stuff. So I love that. That sounds like a pretty great job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And what are you most excited about in your field right now? I am really excited that uh, the science communication field is really growing. And so I've actually met a lot of other um, artists or types of creatives who are trying to communicate or share stories about the climate and the environment with more people. And so when I started, I feel like I didn't know that many people doing it. And that's really changed. And 
the field is really like broadened where there's a lot of different ways that people are doing this. And so it's been fun to see even to make some friends who are doing like um, stuff like me, like art about the environment. They're working with scientists. They go out and hike and make paintings or other types of art, like just that kind of thing has been really fun to see, like have a community built around that idea. Yeah, that sounds pretty lovely. I am also very excited about that field. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, thank you so much, Jill. I appreciate your time. And thank you for joining us today. I'm going thank to you. end the recording if I can find the button. <laughs>